it. So, all right. Okay, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and get started. So this is the second time through of doing um, the uh, Mark Edit webinar. So my plan is to do these once a week for as long as we're all stuck in our houses, um, kind of waiting out the uh, this uh, uh, specific event. So I'm guessing we'll probably do maybe four or five, six of these. Um, at this point, it's a nice break for me from my uh, my regular job of trying to keep the uh, IT running in my library. So this is kind of a little bit of a sanity break for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and do these twice um, uh, during the week, once during a time that should work for a lot of people um, in uh, Northern America-ish areas. And then I'm going to try and do one um, that will fit well for um, the other parts of the world. And so I'm realizing today that my thought of doing this a second time, uh, late Friday night probably wasn't the best idea because I think that means anybody who's watching it in the morning is probably watching it Saturday and who wants to watch these on Saturday. Um, so anyways, I'll adjust the time. So today I'm going to talk about working with tasks. Um, this is one of those things that uh, when people work with Mark Edit, they spend a lot of time um, trying to figure out how to automate uh, the application. Um, and tasks are one of the primary ways uh, that folks can automate the editing of um, parts of the application without having to do a lot of programming or actually any programming. So I'm going to go ahead um, and walk through um, basically uh, two specific topics um, and then if there are any questions at the end I'll answer them otherwise wrap it up and post this on YouTube. So um, we'll look at an in-depth intro to uh, what tasks are. We'll go through all the different task list functions um, including some specific parts of the uh, task list that are being introduced to um, provide some kind of um, condition conditionality or um, looping um, inside the tasks. Uh, we'll look at how to manage them, um, the way that the program works for um, uh, creating the tasks where you can run them in automation. Uh, we'll also talk about how to preserve move task lists and uh, what happens when they're um, uh, when versions are upgraded and how you can work within a networked environment. So if you work in an office and you want to share tasks with lots of people. All right, um, so specific task settings. I'm going to jump back and forth between the program um, and my slides. because I find that's the easiest way to do this. Um, so inside of Mark Edit, there are a couple things that I've been trying to do um, to ensure that when you're working with the application, uh, that the work that you put into the application doesn't get lost, either when you get a new computer or if something crashes um, or if there's just some kind of catastrophic issue that somewhere your data is preserved um, and that you can reload um, it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show you what these look like here. So inside of Mark Edit in the options, and drop that. Inside the options, there's some specific areas that tasks are called um, inside the application. Uh, the first one's in the other settings. This is probably the most important one because it ensures that your data um, is preserved on a daily basis. Um, this option here, which is uh, should be selected by default now, um, will tell Mark Edit to automatically back up your settings. Um, every day. So as soon as you turn your program on, the program will collect all the data um, and create a backup. Um, inside the program, you will find these backup files uh, inside the application data path and underneath settings backups. You'll see they're just a config file that captures, uh, a zip file that captures all the data. Um, if you look at it, you'll see that there are 10 days worth of backups. So the tool captures a snapshot of your day um, and stores it. And as 10 days go through, it rolls the oldest one off and keeps the, the next nine. Um, and so it's consistently backing up your data. So if for some reason you were to open your program up one day and you found all your tasks were gone or your um, ILS integrations are gone and or your Z39.50 settings were gone and you didn't know how to didn't know what they were, you could restore all your data back from a backup from the day before. 
Um, it's a simple process of either um, going to the zip file, copying and pasting, or going to help um, troubleshooting. And uh, it is configuration settings, restore configuration data from backup, and then you just select one of the backup files and the tool will re-import those back into the application. And it's like starting from the beginning of the day um, that you've um, opened the backup uh, from. So that's the first one. Additionally, inside the settings uh, area, um, there are two other places where the, um, the, the um, tasks are integrated into the application. One is in the folder watcher, watch folder settings. So this is something I'm going to talk about in a, in a future um, session. Uh, the folder watcher, the watch folder settings is a special tool inside of MarkEdit that actually runs separate from the application. It's essentially a service that runs on the, the, the system that will watch specific folders or FTP folders and pull new records um, that are placed there into the application, automatically process them using a task or tasks or join or split or XML conversion, translate the data, process the data, and then put it in a finished folder so that you can just take the data and do whatever you need to with it. Um, so that's a, an automation process. I'll talk um, a little bit about that um, in a future session. Um, the other place is uh, in the locations. If you work in a office in a networked environment and you wanted to have uh, two or three people create tasks for the entire office uh, and you wanted to share those, MarkEdit allows you to point the application to a networked folder, either a folder that's been mapped from the network or using a network path, uh, and the application will um, determine that this is a network uh, path and once it's determined it's a network folder it'll do two things. One, it sets the path for the task, the, the, the active task to that network address. The second thing it does is it creates a cached copy of your task files. Now the reason it does that is if you are offline, um, you're not in your office, you have your computer and you want to run your tasks, you want to be able to run your tasks. And so the program keeps the most recent copy of your tasks in a cache and it'll run that cached file when you're not on the network. Um, you can't edit tasks that are in that cache file, but you can run them. Um, when you get back on the network, it'll resync any changes that have been made from the network um, and allow you to change any tasks that are on the network. Uh, the only option that you have to worry about is this network timeout. Uh, this is essentially designed to fix latency issues in a, uh, a network. So by default, MarkEdit defaults to 300 milliseconds. That's roughly um, a, a good number for most networks um, to be able to respond that it's either alive or dead. Uh, and that's what MarkEdit needs to know. Is the network visible or not visible so that it can determine whether or not the tasks um, should be read from the live folder or from the cached folder. If that value is set too low, then the program may think that you're on, not on the network when you actually are because the network doesn't communicate fast enough. Um, in some networks that aren't, um, that uh, have higher latency, you may have to raise that number um, from 300 milliseconds to maybe 500 or 800. I wouldn't go much higher than one second, um, partly because uh, that latency issue affects how quickly the program can move on to other tasks because it has to know whether or not that network file um, is present or not. Um, so that's how you um, set the program up to work within a networked environment. I had somebody this morning ask, could you point to say a Google Drive? So you actually could. Um, a Google Drive, a OneDrive folder um, that everybody shared within your office. Now, um, it works slightly different um, than a networked folder because uh, a Google Drive folder is just a local folder on your system that syncs to um, a network location. So from Mark Edith's perspective, this would be pointing to um, a local file folder um, because it actually is on your system, but you would be able to use that local file folder which syncs to the network um, to share tasks to, uh, within anybody who 
um, has access to that Google uh, folder. So it was an interesting question, not one that I had thought of before, but um, a way to, to do that. Um, so in this period of time that we're in, um, I know a lot of people are um, having to take data from a work machine and maybe transfer it to a um, personal machine uh, to take their, their work with them. So mark at it uh, to facilitate uh, mostly when you get a new computer, um, but to, to facilitate the ability of moving your data from one location to another um, has this concept of sharing configuration settings. So um, like I said, this was initially designed specifically to facilitate the move from an old computer to a new computer that you might get at work. So that way you don't lose any of your settings. Uh, you go to application settings, export settings, um, and you would choose the values that you wanted to take with you. And MarkEdit would wrap those up, uh, put a little bit of special stuff inside of the, uh, the zip folder so that MarkEdit knew how to read and process the data when it comes back. Um, and then you would take that file to your new computer and you would reverse the process and do help configuration settings and import the settings and mark edit would pull all of the data that you had exported back into the application, process any folders that needed to be processed, um, any paths that needed to be fixed, and then set your computer up um, so that it was like you hadn't, um, hadn't moved machines. Um, so for those of us who are having to do a lot of work from home now, um, who are moving from a work machine to a personal machine, maybe in your, at your house, um, this is a way to transfer um, your um, settings from work to your personal PC so that you can continue to work um, in a way that uh, um, you were working uh, in your office. All right, so those are the, so those are those three. Um, in addition to um, the ways that the program automates backup and sharing, there are also troubleshooting tools that are built into the application to help facilitate um, uh, bringing um, tasks back, specifically tasks, if, for example, something were to happen. Um, and there are two places specifically where these are here. Um, you can, like I said, always restore from one of the daily snapshots, but sometimes folks um, just have an issue with the task for some reason. Um, maybe they're on the network and for some reason the network um, link has gotten broken or maybe um, something had happened and most of their tasks are all there, but a handful of tasks um, have disappeared from their list. They need to relink them. So the application includes um, some troubleshooting tools inside of help. Um, you'll see here, um, repair task file. If I had my tasks in a network location, um, I would have the option to restore my network files from a backup. And what that does is that takes the data, mark edit will um, reestablish the network connection and rebuild the local cache from the network files that are available. Um, so that allows me to um, restore from the network. I can also push data that I've saved locally in my daily backups back to the network. So let's say the network had an issue, uh, somebody introduced a virus, all the network files got corrupted, um, you didn't have a backup. If you had your daily backups from MarkEdit, you could push those network to those, those daily backups back up to the network and restore your data. If in your task file you have all your tasks in your application, um, but maybe one or two have gotten lost for some odd reason and you don't want to restore from backup, you can use this option to select tasks to relink. And what this will do is this will let you essentially recreate um, uh, the linkages between MarkEdit and the tasks that you still have on your computer and bring them back into the application so they can be used. All right. All right, then we talked about this one, migrating, moving from one computer to another. Um, so migrating from one version of MarkEdit to another, uh, I will mention this. Uh, so the application by default, um, when you uh, install a new version of MarkEdit will automatically migrate your settings. When you install from um, 
uh, market at six to market at seven, it will automatically recognize that you have uh, market at six installed. And as part of the wizard that you go through, it will um, ask you if you want to import the data from your previous version of Mark Edit and, uh, and take that data in and you can select whatever data you want to migrate from the old system to the new system. If you forget to do that, um, you have Mark Edit 6 installed, you can use the, um, in Mark Edit 6, Mark Edit 6 has the, uh, the, the, um, the share configuration settings. Um, you can export um, your settings from Mark Edit 6 and import your settings into Mark Edit 7. Um, so that allows you to, um, uh, if you forget to migrate your data, that allows you to go back to Mark Edit 6 um, or a previous version of Mark Edit, uh, export your data and re-import it into, into a new version. All right, so I wanted to talk um, really quickly about what the differences are between Mark Edit 6 and Mark Edit 7 in terms of how tasks work. And this is partly because um, I look on a regular basis uh, at the uh, Mark Edit upgrade logs and um, I can see that there are a lot of um, folks that utilize Mark Edit uh, 7. There's still a small um, but um, you know, uh, not insignificant, uh, probably about 15% or so, of uh, folks that still use Mark Edit 6. Um, and there are reasons why folks might do that. Some of it may be that they don't realize that there's a, that the program's updated, even though it's been updated for about a year and a half. Um, some reasons might be because um, they are worried that the tasks won't migrate, um, or maybe that uh, there's a part of Mark Edit 6 that didn't migrate or is in a different place in Mark Edit 7. Um, so one of the concerns though, when Mark Edit 6 came out, 7 came out, was will tasks work the same um, and will they transfer to Mark Edit 7? And so um, the transfer part should happen automatically. When you install Mark Edit 7, it should ask you, do you want to transfer your data? And that gives you an opportunity to move that data automatically. Um, the question is, will they work the same? So the reality is they don't work exactly the same. The output should be pretty close, should be the same basically. Um, but the way that they function works very, very different. Um, in Mark Edit 6, uh, and, and this to be honest is, is, um, is one of those parts of uh, the application that, that's actually uh, vexed me for a long time. Um, Mark Edit has uh, had a long history of different types of ways to introduce automation into um, building workflows. Uh, I've always been, uh, when I first started as a librarian and when I first started working on Mark Edit, my um, initial assumption and kind of the place I started from was that everybody should learn a little bit of coding. Um, and so the way that Mark Edit developed really um, was built around that philosophy. Uh, all of the libraries were exposed so that you could write scripts to them. Um, there was a script wizard that was built, the assumption being that if you wanted to automate the tool, you had to learn how to write either in Visual Basic Script or in Py uh, Perl or um, in uh, Python and call the com objects or whatever language that you were interested in. Um, but there was an assumption that in order to get the most out of the automation process, you, that the people would want to learn how to program. And as I've addressed automation at different periods of the application's lifespan, that's been kind of the, the underlying theme of all of the work that I've done from building a macro language to embedding the .NET framework so that you could work with it. Um, and at some point along the way, um, when I was working in Mark Edit 6, uh, I talked to the Mark Edit community and basically um, a number of the community members helped me understand that that, process, that thought process was wrong. Um, and I'll be honest that the older I've gotten and the more I've worked with, with folks, the less I actually think that everybody needs to learn how to code. Um, uh, and in fact, I think that a lot of people don't want it, shouldn't be learning how to code, um, that it makes more sense to work with people who, to find people who do that for them so that it's done more efficiently. Um, but that, uh, 
the process really should be more about getting out of people's way and providing tools that facilitate kind of the work that they need to do. And so to do that in market at six, that was designed as a, almost like a key logger. So what folks wanted was a way to essentially type things into a screen, um, have the program remember those steps and then run it. And so in market at six, the way the task broker, the way that the task processing worked is um, in the background, uh, the program would open lots of windows that were invisible and would essentially just run the interface, um, just like you were working with it um, yourself, but it would do it really quickly. Um, and that seemed to work really well within essentially a set of guardrails, parameters that I assumed people would use um, when they were creating tasks. I assumed tasks in general would be no more than maybe 20 to 25 steps, um, that folks would have a small number of them, um, and that they would serve a very specific purpose. When I started working on Mark Edit 7, uh, I found that that actually wasn't the case, that I was running into folks that were working with tasks that were working across gigantic sets of records, sometimes million to a million and a half, and they were working with tasks that had thousands of steps. And inside of the Mark Edit 6 assumptions, that just didn't work. Um, it would take sometimes um, almost 24 hours to run through 1,000, 1,500 task steps on a file that large. And so when folks had approached me when I was working on Mark at a 7 asking if I was going to fix the, uh, the, the task processing function, I, I actually didn't understand what they were, were asking until I started to realize um, from talking again to the Mark Edit community that this uh, process that I was seeing was actually more common than I had realized. And so when I sat down to work on Mark Edit 7, I changed the way that tasks process. So the way that Mark Edit 7 works is tasks no longer run through the application. There's a separate part of the application, a broker, that actually interprets all of the tasks that are done. And its job is to take a task, to take a file, and to determine from the characteristics of both what would be the fastest way to process it. And as part of that process, it determines which actions in a task actually are appropriate for the records in the file. And that allows it to speed the process up considerably. So in those examples where a task may have taken you know, 12 to 24 hours to process, I was seeing those times cut down to 10 to 15 minutes because the way the task broker was addressing the process and we were getting better results than we were getting with Mark Edit 6. Um, and so that was kind of how the process has continued to evolve. It's made it easier for me to add functions into the task processing tool too, because now that the, the tasks and the interpretation of the tasks is one step removed from the application, I no longer have to build all of that logic into the tool itself. It all lives inside of the broker and that broker then basically sends messages back to the application and interacts with all of the libraries underneath and makes it a really neat, nice, neat process um, from a programming perspective. Um, so, um, in order to um, use, um, when I worked on Market at 6, one of the things that I tried to do um, was to keep uh, compatibility between Market at 6 and Market at 7. That way, an individual moving from 6, going to 7, um, wouldn't have to change the tasks. And by and large, that um, was accomplished. Um, I think there are only, a, like, I think there's one set of um, uh, tasks actions, and I can't remember what it is, it has to do with a regular expression because the regular expression engine inside of um, uh, the .NET framework uh, updated uh, that allow, that essentially worked um, identically from six to seven. Uh, in order to allow people from uh, seven to go back to six, however, um, as I expand and refine functions in market at seven and provide more options and more functionality uh, within particular task actions, um, I make sure that these actions sit um, in a location so that if you were to share that task with someone using Mark Edit 6, they would also be able to run that task. It just wouldn't understand um, the Mark Edit 7 specific behaviors. 
So what are some of the specific differences in Mark Edit 7? So there are some specific new supported actions um, that are in Mark Edit 7. So all the sorting um, options that are there aren't there. A lot of the um, uh, uh, edit shortcuts um, that are in Mark Edit 7 aren't in Mark Edit 6. The linked data stuff I don't believe is in Mark Edit 6. Um, uh, so a lot of the refinements around um, uh, build new fields and stuff like that. I don't know if those are in, in six. Uh, so those are all elements, new elements that were added to seven. Uh, also added to seven, and I'm gonna show how this works, are this, this notion of control flow. So the ability to add um, loop counters into um, the uh, task functionality, um, as well as what I'm working on right now, the ability to add conditionality into um, control flow and all We'll show you what I mean here in a little bit. Um, also, uh, this notion of being able to add commenting into the uh, tasks. Again, I was thinking of tasks being much smaller, so having comments inside the task itself seemed less important. But when you're working with tasks that are thousands of um, actions long, you definitely want to be able to put comments inside of the tasks. I also wanted to make it easier to create um, tasks in Mark Edit 7 than in, uh, in 7, so you weren't having to do duplicative work. I'll show you what I mean by that um, in a second. Um, and also in Mark Edit 7, I introduced a debugger. So you can actually test um, tasks and see their output without having to run them inside the application and, and try and figure out why something isn't working, which is really useful for me when somebody asks me um, why a task isn't working a specific way. In addition, Mark Edit 7 introduced these things called groups. So again, I um, assume tasks, most people would create a set number of tasks. What I've actually found is there are some people that have created an extreme, a, a huge number of tasks. Um, I actually had somebody recently tell me that they were, tr that they were noticing that Mark Edit was slowing down um, the more tasks they would add. And that was confusing to me because I hadn't experienced that. Well, when they sent me their their folder of tasks, they had almost 2,000 tasks in it. And that does take time. Mark Edit builds, obviously, menus for all of those tasks. So in order to fix that, Mark Edit 7 now uses what's called virtual lists and creates things in a way that um, puts a lot of stuff into memory. Um, it introduced this thing called grouping so that you can create groups of tasks. Um, and what that means is the ability to create, essentially, um, levels within um, the menu entry. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So um, your menu, um, tasks, available tasks here, if I had any. Um, let me go ahead and, uh, so it looks like I do have a couple of tasks here. Um, I can create groups for these. Um, where's my new task group? And then I can put things into those groups. So that then changes the way that MarkEdit um, shows uh, tasks here. So I've got my new task group and I've got my tasks. So it allows me to group tasks together inside of the menus, um, which is kind of um, nice. Uh, at this point, the tool only does one level of grouping. Um, again, to preserve functionality between six and seven. Um, in Mark Edit 7, they get introduced and shown as uh, group tasks. In Mark Edit 6, they get shown where you see the, the, the group name of the task plus the task. So it doesn't create the groups, but you can see them inside. The tool doesn't break the functionality um, if you share them between the two uh, applications. Um, let's see here, I already talked about that. Um, uh, tasks are like a key recorder, sorry I mentioned that. Uh, select dash, oh, task process procedurally. So that's important to remember. So every time you complete an action, the next action in the task can impact, gets to run against the results of the previous task. So that way, um, if you are changing something up in the top of the records and assuming data is there in the bottom, that's where a lot of people run into problems in their task. They don't realize that the data um, uh, up above is changing uh, the results down below. Um, and all tasks are logged. So a lot of times folks will have problems with their tasks. I'll ask them to send me the log files 
um, that they've created, uh, that the market creates as part of um, uh, the debugging process. Uh, and in fact, um, I've tried to make that super simple. Um, if I ask you to send me a, a set of uh, files, um, you can go to here and hit package files for debugging. And what that'll do um, is that will create a zip file of your current log file, any temporary files that were created as part of the session, um, as well as some uh, debugging information that gets captured. And you can then send that to me and it allows me to actually see what happened inside of your session. All right, so let's talk about the tasks themselves. So what actually is inside of the, the task tool and how do they get separated? Because uh, this is different between six and seven. Um, so inside of Mark Edit, uh, tasks are set up inside of the Manage Tasks area. Um, I try to break down um, task actions and management actions based on whether you're creating, editing, cloning, deleting a task. Those would be uh, actions performed um, on a task. So over here, uh, clone, delete, um, edit, new, rename. Um, and then things that um, are performed on uh, a group of or uh, selection of existing tasks. So let's say I wanted to create a new task. I would go here and new task, uh, select. Um, this is my new task. Um, and it goes ahead and opens the task editor. And now I can create my task or whatever I need to do inside of it. I'll go ahead and save that. Uh, you'll see it gets dropped into my default group. Uh, if I needed to clone it, so let's say I wanted to clone this task so I wanted to use that as a starting point. I could just select it, cloned task, um, and now I have a clone task that um, is new and ready for me to be edited. Um, so there we go. Uh, if I wanted to um, do actions upon these tasks themselves, I can go over to the manage existing tasks and that lets me create groups. So I created that new task group. I could create a new group. I can assign keystrokes. So if I wanted to um, inside of Mark Edit, so here when I go to available tasks, I see that the tasks I have here, if I wanted to assign them, reserve them uh, keystrokes, I can go to assign keystrokes and select a keystroke to assign it to. And now inside the application, um, that uh, task can be called by clicking Shift F1 um, instead of having to go through the menu. Um, so Mark Edit allows you to reserve up to 20 keystrokes for um, tasks. All right. Uh, so other things here we talked about, um, I can uh, back up all tasks. So again, some folks have wanted to be able to um, uh, initiate a backup themselves. This will create um, a dot task file that pulls together all your tasks. If you create a dot task file and you want to re-import it back into a version of Mark Edit, you have to use this import task file function here inside the task manager because the dot task file extension, like other parts of the Mark Edit, um, uses um, underlying the underlying uh, file type of a dot task is a zip file, but again, inside the zip file, specific information has been embedded to help the application understand how to reassemble your task files when you import them. Um, I can delete a task group. So let's say I wanted to get rid of the new task group. I can go ahead and delete that task group. Um, I can um, relink tasks from here. So let's say I noticed a task was missing and I could go to relink it. Um, and I could rename a task group. So let's say I didn't like the, this task group name and I wanted to rename it. Named task group. And if we look, we see it shows up here. And then if we go back into the uh, application and we look, we see that it shows up here inside the group. So the application gives you the ability to um, do some different kind of groupings and different kind of organizations of tasks. All right. Uh, we talked about managing all those things there. All right, so creating tasks. So once you have um, figured out that you want to create a task and you've uh, created the initial output, uh, the, the initial task name, you would go into the task list editor. So the task list editor um, inside of Mark Edit. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my uh, file here. This is a blank task. Um, inside of a Mac, 
um, you will see a slightly different uh, interface, but all of the actions that are there are the same. Um, and we can uh, add comments, and then all of these are task actions that I can use, um, including linking to other task lists. So let's say I have a set of, say like 10 actions that I want to perform on multiple tasks. Um, rather than copying those 10 actions in those multiple tasks, I can create a single task list with those 10 actions and then link to that task list by going like this. And now change um, the actions that are performed by that task list in any of the tasks that, that are linked to it. All I have to do is go change the cloned task element. Um, in addition to that, I get to um, add things. So I'm just going to go ahead and add a new field, uh, just so you can see what it looks like. So Mark Edit um, will change the interface, uh, disables a bunch of stuff on the left, turns the background kind of red, um, and that's to tell you that it's doing task editing in a Mac version. It disables links, but up in the top here it says task editor thing, so that way you know you're doing tasks. This is a new field. And go ahead and add that. You see that gets added into the program here. Um, let's say I wanted to create a comment um, so that I know what in the heck's going on here. I can add a comment. This is my comment. Comment gets added into the uh, application inside the list. Um, anything with this pound sign, mark edit six ignores. Uh, mark edit seven will treat as a comment unless um, there's a special keyword that follows it in the back end. And I'll show you what, that, uh, what I mean by that here in a minute. Um, let's say I wanted, I was doing some testing and I wanted to, to comment something out. I can go ahead and comment a section out. So now that won't run. Um, I can uncomment it. So now it does run. Um, and if I want to, I can create um, uh, a task group. So let's say I had four or five actions here and I wanted to bundle them up and create a task list like this. I can just right click on it, um, go to create a task group. And now I've created a task list that I can reference to other tasks. So again, instead of having to duplicate things over and over again, um, I can use task lists referencing each other um, to uh, prevent the need for a lot of duplication. And I'm not going to save that real quick. Um, so additionally, let me grab this one. All right, so um, in addition to um, doing uh, that kind of work, you can also copy things from one task to another. So let's say I was in this task. And I wanted to use this again. I can copy that action. And then I can open this one. Actually, let me open this one and paste that action. So I can copy from one task to another and then I can move them around so that I can put it in a place that I want it to be in. Um, let's see here, uh, what else do I got here? Um, oh, um, the other thing I wanted to point out, uh, I'll go ahead and open this one up, real, actually I'll open this one up really fast, um, is that Mark Edit's uh, task editor, one of the other things that you'll see here that um, I wanna point out is this option here, override broker. So again, like I said, Mark Edit's task um, engine is separate now from the application. So the broker does a lot of assessment to determine which process works the best for translating and processing data using a task on that particular file. Um, if you think that the process is running slower than it should be, um, you can actually tell it to override the broker action and that will tell Mark Edit to do whatever's the opposite of what the broker decides. And then you can decide whether or not that, uh, that was actually the correct decision. Um, that was added originally when Mark Edit 7 was introduced, partly because the broker was so new and I was still trying to sort out some of the assumptions for it to determine when it was better to run the broker versus running, um, when, when the broker needed to do certain things. Um, and so honestly, if you had a very small file that had a lot of task actions, um, the broker did a really poor job deciding which was the fastest uh, way to do that. 
Um, that's been cleared up. Um, I, I actually don't have a need to be able to override it anymore, but I leave that there for folks. Um, that way, if for some reason we run across something that's um, somewhat unique, uh, there's the ability to be able to fall back and check to see which is faster, the broker actions or the, the actions that are the opposite. Uh, let's see where we're at here. Uh, so here's a list of all the special functions I just talked about. Um, the one that I want to talk specifically about is the script actions um, right here. Uh, so this is this notion of introducing um, almost like programming into MarkEdit. So let me show you an example of why this is here. So uh, if you've harvested Mark data, um, harvested data from an OAI server, maybe from Content DM or something, at least that used to work this way, a lot of times you get um, all of the data collapsed into a specific field and you just have them all being like, like this field here. We have a lot of 700 fields, a lot of subfield A's, and what I needed to be able to do was break these up. So you can do that with a regular expression, but it's fairly difficult to do. And so a lot of times what we would, ex if someone would ask this question on the list, the, ex the um, answer would be to do something that looks kind of like this, where you would create a regular expression um, and instead of um, instead of creating recursion into it you would replace it and then you would run it again and then you would click it again and then you would click it again and then you would click it again until you got to zero now if you had a lot of fields that you needed to do that with and you didn't know how long that particular um, set of fields were, you could be clicking for a really, really long time. But that was really the best process for doing it um, that probably preserved um, the, 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 um, the, the file and the data itself and that you could see that it was actually working. So um, to simplify that process, I started thinking about ways to introduce programming concepts without having to have people program. So again, keeping the, simple, the simplicity of creating tasks, but providing some of that um, uh, uh, either conditionality or um, uh, loopiness um, that you might find in a programming language. So inside of the task tool, um, I have um, one that I've created here. We have the ability to, and actually I'll just go ahead and create a new one. We'll just create a new loop so we can talk about how this works. So I'm gonna go ahead and select it, new loop. All right, so I have a new loop. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do two things. First, I'm gonna go back to my file here um, and I am going to grab the task. So this is what I needed. I knew this works. So I'm gonna click this button, copy that to a task. And then I'm going to go to my task editor and I'm going to grab new loop and I'm going to paste that into my action. So now I have the thing that I seen worked. If I click the button lots of times, this will work. And so now what I need to do is I need to have the program click that button lots of times and do it automatically. So inside of the application, if you right click, I added something called script actions. And the, right now it's only, there are only control flow elements, flow controllers. You have a counter loop, which tells MarkEdit to run whatever these, either one selected action or multiple selection actions, selected actions, until it reaches a certain count. So do it five times. Um, or I can use results loop. And in this case, I tell MarkEdit, um, perform the task until it equals a specific number is greater than or less than a specific number. So in this case, what I would like MarkEdit to do is I want it to keep running that action until the results of that action equals zero, because that'll mean that all the fields have been split up. So I'll go ahead and tell it OK. You'll see that this pound signs, what are usually comments, gets embedded into the task, except it has a very specific um, command here. And so MarkEdit 6 will read that as a comment. MarkEdit 7 sees that command string and recognizes it as a control flow. So I will go ahead and save that and go back to my file. And if I run my loop task, my new loop task, you see that MarkEdit 
went ahead and did all of those things for me. It did the loop. And it tells me here that it did four modifications. It, it ran it four times. And if I wanted to look at the log, I could see exactly what was happening during each session. Um, so I can see how the log file was processed um, through the, and how the, the file was processed as it went through. So that gives you the ability um, to introduce almost a lightweight, um, some lightweight programming concepts. And like I said, um, I'm working on trying to add uh, if-then support, essentially, conditional support into those uh, flow controllers. So that way um, you can actually embed um, the ability to say, run these actions if this thing is true or run these actions if this thing doesn't, isn't true. So uh, a kind of an example that shows up on the list all the time is um, run, maybe add these handful of fields or modify these fields, but only if this vendor name is in a particular field entry. Um, and if it's not, then do these things here below it if it's this vendor name, or do these things if it's a different vendor, or do these things if none of those match. So this notion of being able to add um, some conditionality into the, uh, the script wizard uh, or into the task manager is, is kind of the next step that I'm working on. All right. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to point out, because this is something that um, uh, people will ask for, but they don't realize they can do it, is that inside of when you create a task, a lot of people assume that tasks have to be static. They don't. Um, a task can actually accept user input. So let's say um, I needed specific data to show up inside of a task. So um, I have this file here. Um, and what I want to have at the end is I'd like to have new field added, maybe saying that um, I cataloged it. And I want to do it. Maybe this task is a task that's shared across my um, office. So I can't put one name into it. So it needs to be a variable, needs to be variable data. You need to be able to enter something there. So inside of the task tool, um, I'm going to use this one here. Uh, mark edit has a syntax for that. So I'm going to go ahead and show you what that looks like. The syntax is the little squiggly parenthesis line um, input box and then an underscore. And then anything that follows that underscore will be used as the title message that gets prompted to the user and then you close it on the other end. So let me show you what that looks like. So if I run that task, You see that it asks me, enter data for, enter catalogers name here. And when I enter that information, that data is embedded into the record, replacing that mnemonic that I created inside of my task. So mark edit at before it runs any tasks, will go through the task list, determine all the places that need user interaction, will ask you for the values that should go there, and then we'll use those values to populate and make changes to the records based on the information you provide. So it's a pretty cool way to be able to embed um, information that changes between each task run. Um, even though all of the other information may be the same, there may be this one piece of information that changes or changes based on who runs it. Um, and Mark Edit provides you the, the ability to be able to facilitate um, that as part of the task process. All right, so what can't you put in a task? So what can go in a task is just about all the global editing tools and all the shortcuts. Essentially what can't go into a task right now are things that require significant user interaction and decision making in order for the process to finish. So those would be things like the clustering tools within MarkEdit. Um, maybe that's something we should talk about during one of these sessions. Um, it's essentially a lightweight version 
of some of the functionality in OpenRefine that allows you to cluster data together and make changes in cluster groups or extract data in cluster groups. So those tools really can't be embedded into a task. Record deduplication, that tends to be something that requires some kind of user interaction. Merging records, again, it's user interaction to determine which fields need to be merged, usually. Um, control number generation, transliterations, transliterating between um, Latin and, and Arabic, Arabic to, to, to Latin, uh, harvesting data, so like OAI PMH um, or Z39.50, even though there are other methods for creating batch jobs for those, those can't be embedded into tasks. So really it's the things that require significant user interaction in order for an action to complete those are difficult to put into tasks. Now, not all of those are off the table and I do bring some of them in as I go, um, but they are a lot harder to integrate. And even once they're integrated, they tend to be um, things that act on a particular file um, or with a particular set of data. So you have to be able to set like a, um, a settings file that captures what you need to have done that MarkEdit can reference and knows that those data elements will never change. So can you automate tasks? So tasks themselves are an automation, but you can do things to automate processing lots of data with tasks. And this is actually kind of cool. So a lot of people think of the, I think, think of the batch processing tool um, and they think about it in terms of mostly trans, translating data from one format to another. And that's probably because that was what the tool was originally designed for. Here, every function uh, translation that's registered into mark edit shows up here in the function element um, and then you can process file types and whatnot you can do it at a folder level or do it in a folder and then include all the subfolders below it what you can also do though is if you check this box it'll change it so that you can process a task or task group across um, all of the files inside a directory or a directory and subdirectories so let's say um, I had uh, a folder and inside that folder I had um, multiple subfolders and all together inside of those folders and subfolders there were a thousand files and I needed to be able to run um, a set of tasks across those thousands of files and then I wanted to join the results of those files into a single mark record. I could do that in a two-step process. The first step would be to come to the batch records tool, uh, check load tasks, select the task that I wanted to run that included all the uh, parts that I needed to run across those. I would point it at the directory that has the files that I wanna process. I would tell it to include the subdirectories and what the process file type was. So it'd probably be .mrk. I would run the batch process tool. It would run a task across every single file it outputs the data into a folder called processed records and then I could go and open up um, the, uh, the split and join tools and I could join records together. Uh, so MarkEdit facilitates that kind of very large batch processing in, of individual records across multiple folders and then joining them back together so that then they can be used um, for loading into uh, your record set. So that's a, a pretty um, common way that you might use that. Uh, what's the other one? One of the other places that you might see um, integration of tasks is in the ILS integrations. So right now this is Alma specific, but I'm expanding this to include the other ILS integrations. Um, so if you work with connection, um, you may be used to, inside of connection, you can attach um, macros to actions like export actions or save actions. So inside of the ILS integration, I can do the same thing. So process settings allows me to set tasks to run when I import data from the, uh, that ILS through the integration tool. So let's say I'm using Alma. I did a search for a bunch of records. I'm bringing them into ArcEdit. Before those records come to mark edit, any tasks that are selected here will run across those records and the output will be what loads into the application. If I wanna run tasks before I move data back into Alma, I can select tasks to run on export 
And so then anytime I go here and I go to update or create records, where I'm taking the data that's inside of MarkEdit and moving it back to Alma, MarkEdit will first run any tasks that are found inside of this run on export. So it'll take the data that's there, runs whatever you wanna have to finish the process and then push those up to Alma or your ILS for export. So like I said, this particular function runs primarily with Alma, but it's being expanded so that it'll support um, any of the ILSs that you can integrate with, including hopefully um, the OCLC integration. So that way um, users have the flexibility to be able to run tasks um, a lot like the same way in OCLC's connection, we're able to attach macros to actions. All right, so what's the next one here? Um, and then the last one that I wanna point out is um, just the good old fashioned command line. So Mark Edit does have a command line tool. Um, I use this primarily on um, Linux. Uh, if you're going to run it on Windows or even if you're running on Linux, I'd recommend um, setting an environmental path so you don't have to remember where it's installed. Mark Edit on Windows will do that for you. If you check this box right here, it'll set a Mark Edit path um, so that way you don't have to remember where the program is installed. Uh, so essentially, I can go uh, percent mark edit path. And so this will show me all the help stuff. So Mark Edit does have a dash task. So that would be um, the task parameter. Um, essentially, you provide Mark Edit a, um, a source file, a destination file, and a task file. And Mark Edit will allow you then to automate that process through the command line tool. Now, where this is really useful is if you're embedding, if you're using other programming languages uh, like Python or Perl. Um, and you want to build, you just want to use um, the command line tool to essentially pipe data to it, you can do that process with MarkEdit using the command line tool to send it um, a source file, a destination file, a, a task file, and an output file, and create a different kind of workflow that builds around um, the command line tool. Again, um, while MarkEdit has a user interface on Windows, Mac, and Linux, um, although it's a little bit less robust on the Linux side, um, the command line tool does provide a really flexible option for being able to uh, process large data, set, data sets, do it in an automated fashion without having the overhead of the interface. Um, and in fact, on Linux, which I use quite often for large data jobs, um, I only use the command line tool uh, for that processing. All right, and I think that's it. So um, again, um, I'm going to go ahead and post this up to YouTube. Uh, my intention um, uh, is as long as we are doing um, the, as long as we're in this kind of event where we're kind of in this weird place where everybody's doing remote work um, and we have this unique opportunity to do some professional development, get together as a community occasionally and, and um, uh, you know, talk about um, uh, how we do our work. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do these webinars. Uh, I think it's going to be fun. It's kind of a nice break for me um, from other work that I'm doing. Um, and it gives me an opportunity to come back and talk to the community and maybe get a chance to um, uh, learn some of the um, things that the community is trying to do that maybe Mark Edit um, is struggling with or there are places where it could do better. Um, I think I had mentioned that I have some ideas of some of the things I'd like to cover. I'd like to talk about working with non-MARC metadata in MARC Edit, since that's a lot of what I do now within the application. Um, I think I'd like to talk about um, uh, working with linked data in MARC Edit, um, linked data, Sparkle data, um, and how the application handles that, um, and the way MARC Edit's building on top of the linked data engine that's built into the application. Um, I think I'd like to talk generally, uh, maybe a session specifically about working within the Mark Editor um, and all the different functions that are there. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, schedule these to work um, somewhere between an hour, hour and a half. Um, like I said at the beginning, I'm going to play around with the scheduling a little bit. Um, when I first started doing this, I wanted to be able to do um, a session that would work well for uh, my schedule. Um, uh, so that folks um, in um, you know, North America areas um, 
particularly universities in, in the United States and Canada, where I work most often, um, would have an opportunity to be able to participate. And so that tends to work well for me on Fridays, you know, somewhere between 11 and 1. Um, but I'm realizing as I'm doing this now um, that while 11 o'clock in the afternoon, in the evening, may be a great time um, for uh, folks not in my time zone, 11 o'clock in the evening um, on a Friday night, my time probably isn't the best time because most people are probably on their Saturday. Um, and who wants to sit down and, and talk about um, working on Mark Records. So I'll probably adjust um, the, uh, the late night one. Um, I'm going to try and find another time. Uh, if you um, have a particular opinion, let me know. I'll probably shift it though to Thursday and do maybe Thursday 11 my time. So that would be um, Friday in the morning for folks um, uh, that this probably would target most often and then do um, on Friday um, a session that'll either be uh, somewhere between uh, 11. It'll either be as early as 11 or as late as one. And I'm probably leaning more towards one because I thought that, would, that worked well for me today. Um, so that's kind of what I'm going to do. If you have questions, uh, you can feel free to let me know. And also, um, if you have ideas for these webinars, who knows how long this is going to last. Um, I think we're kind of in a unique situation and I'm um, open to suggestions if, if something comes up uh, that you'd really like to talk about. So we will we'll try this out and, uh, and kind of work and learn hopefully together and maybe it'll come up with some uh, some really interesting enhancements with the application too um, as we kind of talk about um, different uh, functions and maybe some some gaps that exist uh, so hopefully this is useful um, like I said it's going on to YouTube and uh, um, I will hopefully see some of you again next week <laughs>